All righty, and we are live. What's going on, everybody? It's Wednesday night, and it's time for the Screaming Room. And uh, yeah! you know, I'm your host, DJ Remark. With me is Mr. Kanan Becker of Ghost Pirate Entertainment. Bethany, What's up, guys? And Bethany and Jay are uh, out today. They have a job that they are working on, and uh, we we have an even bigger job next week that we're going to be starting. We're starting principal photography on the Hellgate Monday, April 1st, April Fool's Day. So everybody get hype. We're going to be talking about that, sharing a lot of behind the scenes stuff as we get going. But um, Kanan, why don't you tell everybody what we got in store for uh, for the show tonight? Uh, well, you caught me off guard. I thought you had it. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2, which came out yesterday. We're going to talk about um, Late Night with the Devil that both me and DJ were able to check out this past week as well as I'll talk a little bit about Immaculate and just horror news in general. The box office was one of the biggest horror box offices we've had for an opening weekend. And I think it was, a I think I read that it was like a decade since we had wow. an opening with this many horror movies that all made like decent money. So yeah. Nice. Good signs. And we will talk about all that and more right after this. <laughs> It wasn't until 2020 that I actually sat down and watched Texas Chainsaw. All right, how do I turn this on? All right, it's 7 p.m. Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, Wednesday, and it's your favorite podcast about indie horror and horror news and filmmaking. I'm DJ Remark. I'm your host for Bloodscribe Creations. With me again is Kanan Baker. Kanan Becker, excuse me, sorry, buddy, from Ghost Pirate <laughs> Entertainment. And uh, we're going to talk about some movies. So I think um, my name does derive from a baker, so it's not too far off. It might like be German. Yeah, my name Becker. is. Oh, German. yeah, Becker. Becker sounds Baker. like a German. Yeah. My uh, remark yeah. is a German last name. Oh, is it? It is. It's it's a hundred percent German. It just doesn't. It just doesn't sound like it. I did. But my none of my I, family was in Germany during World War II. Just <laughs> so everybody knows. <laughs> I'm sure some of mine were, but they were all like pickle farmers. So yeah, you know, we were, we were all over here by then. But uh, yeah, so uh, I guess biggest news for for me is uh, we are beginning production on the Hellgate on Monday. So uh, so exciting! Have, it, it's 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 very exciting, but also overwhelming. <laughs> like yep. it's we've been working. I've I have personally been working on this film for two years, just between writing and pre and pre production, and I'm not even trying to tell like a huge, complicated, convoluted story. It's about two girls who accidentally capture footage of a ghost in a graveyard and then they get haunted. And, you know, and so, and the story develops, it's really sort of a, um, it's my love letter to horror movies and metal music. The two things that I love so that, that's, that's what this film is. So it's, there's a lot of passion that goes into that. Uh, and it's also a story about obsession and, uh, you know, how that can strain a friendship. And so how, how these two girls uh, are able to maintain their friendship while all of this crazy stuff is happening to them. And, um, you know, we are, uh, so I'm trying to tell a good story that way, but I'm also trying to have, I, there's plenty of fan service for all, you know, all types of horror fans. So uh, I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff in there that a lot of people are going to like. So I'm really excited to begin production on this and see how it unfolds. It's my first feature film. Uh, I got a great crew. Jay and Bethany are both part of my crew. And I, I'm just super excited and I'm just ready to get it done. Like, I'm just ready to, I'm ready to start. I'm ready to go. And for the next 16 days, uh, we're going to make a movie. So, uh, oh, it's going to be a lot longer than that <laughs> because 16 days is just the shooting part the, for uh, some people. It'll be just 16 days, but for you, it's going to be like another, the next year. Oh yeah. For me, it's going to be the next two years. Cause after, cause yeah. I'm doing the editing. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm doing the editing and I gave myself, uh, I'm going to, so I'm going to take about a week and a half off after we complete shooting after the film is in the can, as they say, I'm going to take a week off so that I can just decompress and just not think about anything. I'm going to hang out with my girlfriend. I'm going to hang out with my cat and we're going to have, we're just going to have a time that is not the Hellgate, And then I'm going to get into the editing process and I want to get this film at picture lock. So no more edits by my birthday, August 17th. That is when I want to have it done. I'm going to then send it off for color correction, color grading, and, uh, you know, audio uh, mixing and mastering that whole shebang. And then it is off to the races for uh, getting some distribution. I already have interest from a few distributors who are uh, clamoring for a screener. So uh, as soon as I, you know, get, something to show them. Uh, I'm going to be blasting yeah. it off to, to some distributors and hopefully, hopefully we can make a deal. Um, I, cause it's not that I wouldn't want to go the festival route with this because I would, I like festivals. Um, you know, I, I would love to be able to do that. Uh, but if I can get, uh, you know, a decent enough deal, uh, I, that's, that's what I'm going to try to do. And, uh, I've spent a lot of time in the music business. I've spent a lot of time, uh, researching and looking up, you know, film business distribution, talking to other distributors and, uh, people who have had their films distributed through the distributors that I've been looking at, talking to them to see what their relationship has been like. And uh, I, I think uh, I think we're going to have I think we're going to be successful. We're going to make some money off this movie. So um, uh, the, the future well, is even, bright. Even if you have a distributor, you can always still premiere it at a festival and get that buzz from the festival for it. Yeah. You know, like late, like, for instance, Late Night with the Devil. It was picked up by IFC and Shutter quite a while ago and yet it still premiered at a uh, fantastic fest uh i think it was last month yeah uh, so a lot of these will still do that and so that way they're still getting that festival publicity and write-ups from all the early reviews and whatnot uh, even if you have a distributor so you know yeah well uh you don't have I, to it, just do that way. i guess i guess it'll depend on what uh what what we want to do with it but uh i i do have I do have about four or five festivals that I definitely know I want to, um, I want, I would like it to screen at. So if we can, yeah. if we can get a distro deal and, uh, run the festival circuit, I, I do have ones that I think I, I want it to, to screen at that I think will, will be really good for it. And will be really good for, uh, and the movie will be really good for those festivals. So, um, yep. We got some folks in the chat already. We got Hunter in the chat. What's going on to Hunter? He says, Hey gang, did a Stephen King marathon over the weekend. Friday night, nice. watched Misery. Awesome. Saturday, watched six hour miniseries, The Stand. Saturday night was Cujo. And Sunday, dude, was that Scorpio. is the most boring miniseries. <laughs> well, what'd you think of I, it, Hunter? Did you like it? Uh, let, let us know. Lee's in the chat I says, you must have had to have been there. Uh, thank you, Lee. We're actually hoping to get a new introduction here pretty soon. Uh, Matt Brown's in the chat. Matt, what's up? Matt's going to be in the Hellgate. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, Luria. Hi, Luria. Good to see you. My, uh, my friend out of Ohio, Leslie's in the chat. Hey, Leslie. Good to see you girl. James is in the chat. What's going on, James? We got our, got our regulars in here. So, yep. uh, what did so you love, guys love you guys loving to see you guys. All right. Well, um, so we actually have, so Jay and Bethany, like I said, are not, uh, not on, the show tonight. However, we do have a review of a film from Jay. He managed to send us uh, a video. So I'd like to start off with his review of the movie Coherence. Have you seen it? Me? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I'm talking yeah. to you. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> what, what, of what, course what did you, what, well, I know. I just, we had conversations before this. So it's like, no, all right. Well, I, you know, it's like, but of course, nobody else hears that. <laughs> right yeah i have definitely seen this movie i love it for an indie like super micro budget movie it is so creative like what they're able to pull off and in, in it with such a like it, it shows how the most important thing in your film is good writing and creativity it's like if you have those things you don't need a budget you know what i mean like you, you could still create something worthwhile with litter, I mean, we've seen how many movies where it's like a one room and, and, you know, and this isn't a whole lot more than one room. Like for a, a lot of the movie, it's really just that one location, that house. 
So yeah, well, the whole location is the is that yeah, the house in the front street, I think it is. And and mm -hmm. I mean, if we want to get real technical, it is kind of one room. They don't really go into I mean, th I think yeah, like it's that living room. They go into the bathroom a couple times in the kitchen once, I think, and then everything yep. else is just in that living room. And but it's uh, literally and, shot. It's one of their houses. Like it's they the, literally yeah, shot it right, in their house. It's the writer director. It's not house. like yeah, it's not like some big mansion kind of thing where they had to find a friend that had this big. No, it's literally like the most track home you've ever seen. It's just like a regular old neighborhood, you know, like a decent, yeah. like middle class neighborhood, middle class house, like. But it's so imaginative because of the way it deals with its concepts. And um, yeah, anyway, let's hear let's hear what Jay says about it. All right, here we go. This is my third time trying to do this because first time camera fell, second time <laughs> phone died. It's the third time. This week I was Practice, asked to watch man. Coherence, Practice. directed by James Ward Burkett. This film grabbed my attention immediately with a very organic backseat shot of a woman on a phone while driving. By the way, let's keep track of how many times I say organic because that is the word that comes to mind for this film. The, the shot the was day. out of focus. It was the, sh the DP was struggling probably on purpose to keep, to keep the subject in focus and in frame. And I felt because of that, that... Uh, I was along for a bumpy ride. I felt voyeuristic. I felt like I was in the back seat with them, and I was definitely in. The conversation she was having on the phone, uh, I think, lent itself to this feeling of improv or ad libbing. And uh, that was the second thing that struck me about this film, um, which I really love. We then begin with one of my favorite ways of telling stories in vignettes, which are short scenes without really a beginning or end. They're just cutting through these uh, these introductions of these characters at this party. Every one of them felt organic. The casting was really good. They all had two-hour faces. All memorable performances in their own way. They were all varied. What I liked most was the distance and age between the youngest and the oldest. I feel that most casting directors get married to the fact that people that hang out are within like four or five years of each other which I guess works for high school films. But as we become adults, I think we start to broaden yep. that. Most of the dialogue in those vignettes was ad-libbed. Um, I felt they had plot points that they were to follow. I think they got to them pretty quickly and effortlessly. Um, it uh, The camera work was interesting because they, they shot with multiple cameras, giving it a, a reality show feel in a good way which again, lent itself to the authenticity of what was happening. On a note for the DP, I also was disappointed. Uh, I feel like the only thing that really hampered them was the fact that I don't believe they shot with much lighting at all. I think they used a lot of um, practical lights. I think they used a lot of candle lights. And I think this is where the budget kind of came across and hurt them in a way that the, the color grade was pushed past or beyond what I think the original footage could handle. I felt like it maybe was shot eight or 10 bit. It was also pushed a lot. Leaving some weird artifacting on and yeah. banding on their faces on uh, slightly overexposed spots. Their faces looked a little jaundiced or yellow, but it also lent itself again to more of a realistic documentary feel. So again, I don't know if that's working in its favor or against it. I'm just going to just go ahead and say it gets a pass for a lot of reasons. Still, give them massive respect and credit for doing what they did with such low light and most likely at a fifty thousand dollar budget maybe they weren't shooting on a camera that was as as equipped as they would be today so i think today's fifty thousand dollar films look a lot different than 2014 uh, fifty thousand dollar films these characters feeling so real left me feeling trapped in a way with them because i was believing them this is a sticking point between myself and most horror films is the characterizations I think they were all um, varied enough and they had enough personality to where I did feel a lot of sympathy for them. Pacing. This is where I think it needed a little help. And I think, again, for a couple reasons, it worked for and against this film. Once we realized there was something going on, I think the characters became a little worried a little quick before anything really should have made them worried. Once they became worried, it then escalated faster, trapping us in this long second act. I think it works because I know a lot of audience members probably talked themselves through it. What would I do? What are they doing wrong? And, and new information wasn't added very quickly. So on the one hand, it felt long. On the second hand, when we did reach that final act, I think it was uh, 
more cathartic because when it happened, I thought we were going to draw that out as well. And our lead going off to find something else in different houses, and we will leave it there without too many spoilers. I felt kind of exhilarated and I, I felt lifted and I was really rooting for her to find what she was looking for. And I didn't know what that was, but we had some theories. And once she got into a new house and did what she needed to do or what she felt she needed to do, I think it was handled quickly. And that surprised me and that caught me off guard because of that middle chunk. So it actually had more impact for me. The very, very end when our two characters said our, their goodbyes or in a way where we said good, our goodbyes to these characters, it ended so abruptly. I think the second thing that that filmmaker wanted to do was to send you all home to talk about this film even more. Yep. This is all very, very good. For that reason, this film is the first of three to crack the eights. I give this film an 8.4. Suggest me a film that maybe cracks an 8.5. Suggest me a film that maybe cracks a 9. Let's see what you got. <laughs> so there That's it is. Pretty well, pretty, pretty well done movie. I haven't seen it in a while, so it's tough for me to like uh, disagree with anything he said. Um, the only thing is I would say that a little bit of the artifacting and the quality of it does kind of for me work it kind of almost psychologically is something i'm not even really thinking about but when movies have that it, it gives them almost a more relatable almost like you're feeling you're watching a whole movie or something like it just doesn't quite feel as like hollywood you know it's like sometimes having a little less polish and having a little of that can actually help a movie in in some some ways i think yeah, I agree. And um, I, you know, I can forgive uh, what a movie looks like if the story is and the characters are really well done. Uh, I, I feel like I sort of stop like I don't notice the technical flaws that are present if I'm engrossed in the story, which is why it's so important, you know, and, and that's and, and that's why like I love I, I love horror fans because they're they're very forgiving about a lot of stuff uh but but i'm especially forgiving of films that uh have good story and good characters like coherence uh that might yeah. have you know a little bit less uh, on the technicality uh i think I, you know i and i'd rather see i guess visual uh issues than auditory issues so the fact that the audio is very good uh, also helps because that helps to keep you in the film uh, so I'm really happy that, uh, you know, that that was able, that they were able to pull that off. I just thought this was a great movie when I watched it. I, I, I thought agree. it was fantastic, simple story, one location and what they were able to do with it. Uh, it's like know, it, simple story, high concept. Yeah. It never got silly, you know, which is what I'm okay. going to, I'm going to, I have a comment about that when we get into our, our next bit of news. Uh, but, uh, it never got silly. And, and so I really enjoyed that. And then I thought the ending was very good. I, I thought it, you know, it definitely left you with, uh, with something to, something to talk about, um, you know, after it's over. So I think, uh, it all depends on the intentions of a movie in a lot of ways. So like if the story isn't that strong, but visuals are, and the characters or, or action or gore or whatever, it's about the intention to me of what the movie is trying to do. So it doesn't always have to have a super strong story for me, but if it is trying to have a, I guess what I'm basically saying is it's kind of, I went and saw Winnie the Pooh blood and honey two yesterday. And I posted a review of it earlier today. And, and that's kind of my issue with, with that movie it's like it doesn't know what it wants to be if you're going to be a silly dumb slasher where everybody's just killing every you know people are just getting killed the story doesn't matter the characters don't really matter it's like a like a friday the 13th situation that's fine because that's its intention that's what it's trying to do but if you're going to have a dark story a gritty story you know it's going to be these characters and this hereditary kind of thing that hangs completely on the story that's what matters more than anything. Even if the visuals aren't there, you got to have that part because that's the intention of the movie. 
And it's like with Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, it doesn't know what it wants to be. It's like this dark, disturbing, uncomfortable, kind of almost depressing story. The movie itself has no real joy in it. But then it's also this crazy, bombastic slasher where there's these fucking anamorphized animals are running around hacking people up in like yeah. generic looking ways where they're ri- like literally grabbing arms and pulling them off. Like, like we're talking that kind of stuff that is so not realistic. And so it just has this, and I'm getting beat up in my comments uh, today <laughs> from that review from people that like people love this, like the, not a lot, but some people I should say love this, these movies. <laughs> It's like I'm not hating on him. Like people say, I hate it. It's not like I hate it. It's just I, I think they take themselves way too serious. Like you, you know, you're yeah. not going to make a hereditary with Winnie the Pooh running around, right? It just, well, you and, just when, can't and when do you have that. when you have filmmakers that attack audience members that don't like the movie, then I mean, it, it's probably it's probably pretty indicative of their of their skill, you know. So. Well, I, they're super we'll young, see. and there's been a whole thing this past week with this other YouTuber friend of mine, Cody Leach, who actually had a sit-down meeting with them because he was one of the people that they came after the most for his review. Um, oh, my God. And they actually had to sit down and talked about it this past week and, and apologized to him and, and like oh, buried the good. hatchet. And, you know, I, I've been privy to a lot of the behind-the-scenes things with that, and they're just young. They were getting a lot of hate for that first movie. And and, and in the beginning, they and I can kind of in a way relate to it because like on any level, when you start all of a sudden getting like a public feedback on something you do, even positive, negative, whatever, it doesn't even matter. It's just overwhelming. If you've never had something like, you know, pop off and all of a sudden, like I remember last year when I had my first video that kind of popped off some got like a hundred and something thousand views in like a you know like a week or two and i had just literally like you know thousands of comments it was like the first time i had ever had that level of feedback even though the vast majority of it was positive it was still overwhelming and so like i'm sure i understand all that so i don't really blame them for that and i do think that in a lot of ways this is just young creators trying to find their way i just feel like take the money and run guys you know like i said that in my (laughs) review take the money make a couple of these take the money from that and make start making the legit movies you want to make yeah improve on your craft yeah but instead they already announced this huge it's called the pooniverse yeah Yeah, it's called the pooniverse it's even (sighs) yeah (laughs) well uh, we'll talk about that more in a little bit, but, uh, I want to get to, uh, and I got some, uh, show production here. I want to get to, uh, late night with the devil and immaculate shatter, uh, box office records for both, uh, IFC and, uh, neon. And, yeah. uh, if we're looking at the, uh, we're looking at the financials here. Uh, it says that, uh, late night with the devil's worldwide box office is just over 3 million. And uh, I know I, I'm pretty sure that's over its budget. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think they spent. Oh that yeah, making this. Um, no, it's, it's it over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's trending upwards. I mean, like th- this is where it's going. We're we're not seeing. You know, this is opening. This is opening day. Uh, this is you know this is that weekend. And uh, I, I I mean it looks like it could. I, I mean it it's going to be over here pretty soon. You know, once these, once these numbers update, but, uh, but you, you and I both saw late night with the devil. Uh, what did you think? I uh, absolutely loved it. I did a review on my channel. Um, and I was frustrated because like right after seeing it before I even got my review up, I started seeing all these like people trying to blacklist the movie like literally trying to uh boycott it because of the the use of three um ai generated images in the movie and it, it's so frustrating me because the filmmakers came out and said that they did this they weren't 
hiding from it at all. Uh, they said that when they did it, it was a couple years ago, and it was before a lot of this heat was on the whole AI thing. On top of that, they took they, they had an artist. It wasn't like the the director or writer did it. They had artists, and they used these AI generated images and then tweaked them and and manipulated them until they were like what they were you know wanting for like a logo and stuff like that. And they're literally like background images that have no. They, they don't hurt the movie or help the movie. They're really, you know, inconsequential. They're just there. And, but you got people freaking out about it. And so I ended up. What were the, the AI track. images? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to find them. It's like that owl, the owl logo and the little skeleton looking thing, you know, like those inner cut, like oh, when they would go to are, commercial and stuff. Those are AI. Oh, I guess they yeah. are. Hang on, let me, let me, yeah. let me pull these up. Let me, let me pull these up. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm on X right now, but I'm going to see if I can't, uh, um, whatever we're going to, we're going to give some, we're going to give some, uh, some screen time to, um, um, discussing films X profile. So just give me a second so I can, so I can share this. Yeah. Uh, I so just, these, uh, these are the, this is one of the AI generated images. That's fine. I didn't even yeah. notice. If like, you guys, like, if you guys are just listening to this and can't see the images, they are pretty easy to find on on online. Just simply look up AI generated images because it's a big story that a, a lot of people have been overblowing, in my opinion. That's, yeah, I, so that's yeah, one if, of them. If, if people are up in arms about this, go screw yourself. <laughs> I mean, this is this is fine. I, I don't think this is a problem. And especially, I mean, I don't know, man, like my opinion I mean, I, about my opinion about AI and AI images has, has sort of changed over the last couple of years. Um, I, I, you know, I still think a lot of AR, AI art is pretty cringe and you can, I mean, you can tell where AI art, you know, is most of the time. Um, I, I would say even 90% of the time. Um, but something like this, I'm, I'm going to give a pass to a film. I'm not going to try to blacklist it or to be like, well, they use AI for this. Blah, blah, blah. Like, I mean, come on. The art department got paid in this movie. The, the, yep. Nobody, it's, nobody it's, lost it's, money on this. Well, and that's where the argument is because the way AI generated art is created. It, the argument is that it is literally stealing other artists, original art because it's taking everything it sees on the internet, you know, and from its database, so to speak, and it makes its own image using those things. But what annoys me so bad is every one of us, and I am included in this as an artist who I've created lots and lots of art in my life. We all use things like, you know what I mean? Like every artist I know that does like photo manipulation on Photoshop, you take like an, a, 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 you know, a, uh, whatever image, you know, whatever. And you start doing things to it, adding to it, taking away from it, cutting it, all these things, like how all thumbnails are made on YouTube. Every single thumbnail, it's you're using AI. another photograph, another image. And like, we're basically being AI ourselves. We're doing the exact same thing that AI is doing. We're taking these things we find, even if you're not physically taking something, like say you're a, you're you're illustrating something or you're painting something, you're still taking things you've seen, other art throughout your life and other images you've seen throughout your life, and smooshing it together to create your own thing. That's literally what AI is doing. So, I I just think it's it's overblown. I, I like uh, the the thing is with this, if we start arguing over this now then we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater because no matter how you look at it, AI is here to stay. Right. It's not going anywhere. Right. And, and we either can look at it as a tool, like we do Photoshop and figure out where our line in the sand is. So we know when we can in lockstep be like, okay, that's not okay. You know, like coming in, like what Disney done where they come in and literally take uh carrie F or uh is it carrie fisher yeah carrie, carrie fisher, fisher's yeah. likeness yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean they either straight up do that uh, it, like it blows my mind everybody was like wowed over that and like oh wow and like dude do you guys not realize like th that they That's did AI. not give her a state shit that was right. literally an ai generated thing basically yes you had real artists 
in the background doing the face swap kind of stuff, but it it's still AI. It, it, there's so much of what that actually, how you do a face swap is literally AI. You feed in, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of images of that person into this database for this program. And it spits out this video of that person. Yeah. And yet Disney has been getting away with it now already for like probably a decade and nobody says shit. And now all of a sudden this tiny indie movie that had it under a million dollar budget, you know, it's, it's frustrating because it's taking away like on one hand, all publicity is good publicity. And I don't yeah. care what anybody says, people talking shit about this is only going to probably help it in the long run, but it does bother me because it is such a good movie and it's such a fun, refreshing movie in a lot of ways that I wish we were talking about the movie and not about the, the hot button issue right now in, for 2024, you know? Yeah, no. And, and I would love to talk about the movie. I, so I needed to take a couple, I needed to I saw it on Sunday. My girlfriend and I went to go see it on Sunday and, um, I, my coming, coming out of the theater, I, I was happy. You know, I enjoyed it. I thought it was, I thought it was one of the better indie films to come out. Uh, but I wanted to sit and kind of marinate on it because, uh, what happened for me was I thought that the film towards the end started getting into more Hold on, like pause real quick, pause real quick. We will not spoil this because this is a new movie. So anybody right. listening, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll be careful uh, how we dance around all this. So like, yeah. I don't want yep. you to turn us off or also, you know, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, no spoilers. Don't worry. This will be a spoiler free uh, review and reaction. Um, but towards the end, it started getting into some silly territory for me. And this is where I would have liked to see maybe more of that analog horror uh, influence in this. And one of the things that I'll bring up, and I'm not sure if you've seen this yet or not, but there's a, there's this short that played on adult swim years ago and it's called too many cooks. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I thought this movie was going to do when it came to it's like, imagery and like trying to unsettle you because it was shot like one of, you know, like a late night show in the, in the seventies. Right. That's how it yeah, was I mean, shot. It straight up feels like you're watching TV. It like, right. took me back. Like you're a little young, uh, but like it literally felt like I was watching Johnny Carson when I was like six, seven years old. Like it, yeah. it was wild. And like, and that's one of the interesting, and that's why I say unique and original because I'm not saying this is a game changing kind of movie. It's not even meant to be, it's not meant to be like an all time classic, anything like that. This is just meant to be a fun indie movie, but right. like what it did do that I felt really unique was that it does what found footage did a while back, but now we've kind of all become desensitized to, and that's basically pull you into that world. And it's like for that hour and a half, you forget, like a part of your mind forgets that you're sitting in a movie theater and you're in that world. And, and this, because it's like a TV show, like you feels like you're literally watching a late night show. It's easy to get into that. It just feel like you're chilling in your living room, watching a real late night show. And so then when it goes off the, off the rails, you know, it, 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 it has that surprise factor, but it isn't really that disturbing of a movie. Right. And I think that's, I get what you're talking about because too many cooks keeps ramping it up and gets more and more fucked up and weird as it goes. Right. But it like never, this loses. to me, yeah, but this to me feels like it's like three quarters of the way through too many cooks where it never quite goes off the deep end on the level that too many cooks does. If that makes right. sense. But I, and I'm trying to, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to say this without spoiling anything, but I, I, I just don't feel like, so like you were saying, it feels like you're watching this show. That's it. It definitely feels like that uh, with, with everything that they did with it until we get to that, to the climax. And then it's like, well now, now I'm not buying in as much because I know what I'm watching on screen is, 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 you know, not actually happening. You know what I mean? As far as from, from a, from a technical standpoint, it's obviously happening within the story in the terms of the film, but technically 
watching this movie, I, I started seeing that stuff happen and I'm like, eh, I, I don't, I, I don't quite know. So that's, that's the one There's thing that's going to take it down a peg for me. It's hard to not spoil this because I can't really say this without spoiling it. So I'm not going to, but there's a little thing that I think you kind of missed. And a lot of people I've, I've read read like that have written comments about this. There's a tiny little thing about that ending that I think a lot of people miss. And if you look at it the way I see it, it, it makes more sense. And it's you- that the delusion was everything prior to a certain point in the movie, if that makes sense. Right. Like what you're seeing, no, I get that. you're duped into thinking is reality. And in reality, it's flipped. And what you're, the reality is when it flips. Right. Does that no, make no, no. Sense? I, 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 that's yes. a little spoilery, but not too much. I, I don't, I don't think it was, but it does make sense. And, uh, if you haven't seen the movie yet, um, guys, please, please go see late night with the devil. Uh, we, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, and but that's what's but such I, a cool thing about such a tiny movie like that, that it, it has like, rarely do you see such an indie small concept in a way movie have something as profound as that to where there's multiple ways you can see it playing out you know yeah. like there's there's different interpretations here and i think that that is a testament to what they did because anytime generally there's a situation like that it's a much more deep movie that isn't a lot of fun it's more of a slow burn and so for this to movie to be like fun and and uh, and not i wouldn't say silly but it is campy and it's meant to be like in that it's campy in the way that those 1970s sick or uh, uh uh late night shows were where the jokes were were dumb like you watch all this stuff and it's a little cringy you're just like oh god i can't believe they told that joke you know everything had a little cringe to it so this plays out that way yeah i didn't uh, have i didn't have a problem with that and i even really liked i i like the james randy character uh, you know who James Randi is? James Randi. He, uh, the magician that was trying to disprove everything. Yeah. Yeah. So I, he, I, I thought he was great. Yeah. He, he was, was very great, good. Like, but, but he's, he's, he's based good. off of a real person is a, is a, he's yeah. a, um, he's a magician named the, called the amazing Randy. And mm-hmm. there's a documentary out about him called an honest liar. And he, he did walk around with a hundred thousand dollar check that he was yep. going to sign over to somebody who could prove that yeah, they had. He, Psychic ability. Well, isn't he, isn't he the guy that it's actually a million dollars, but now, uh, started that, that, uh, what, it's like at a certain college or whatever. And he started a program there and I believe it's a million dollars now. If anybody it's probably a million dollars and, now. Yeah, yeah. And prove, cause I believe he's the one that's, I know that I know that everything you said is true, but I'm saying, I think he's the guy that started that. I just can't remember what college. I want to say Harvard, even though that sounds wild, but it's know, an it actual legit research thing. But it's like there's a million dollars if you can go in there and prove actual real psychic uh, phenomena, right? Um, and 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 well, nobody's nobody's claimed the money yet. Nope. And it's so and, and, it, it's so. I thought it was really cool in this movie too because in the trailer it looked fun. Okay, I was like, oh, it looks fun. I'm definitely down. I mean, I see everything regardless, but it looked like a fun time, right? But what surprised me and I also thought was refreshing is that it's not just a possession movie. You know what I mean? I thought it was just going to be another uh like a an exorcist possession and like it is, but it isn't. It takes some 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 pretty big swings and and like it's not even about like it's not even about that. It's really about like the 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 tone of the movie, the character that David Dismalshan plays. Like that is such a non thing in a way in the movie, if that makes sense. You know, the the the, I would, the little girl. I would like to see David. I don't know how Dismalshan. Is that how you pronounce yeah, his last name? I Desmond. have no idea. Yeah, Dismalshan. Dismalshan. I'd like to see him in more leading roles. Yep. He always. That's what I said. Him. He always plays character roles and he's great in his character roles, but I, I, I thought he was excellent as a, as a, as a leading man in this. Have you uh, ever listened to the last podcast on the left podcast? No, 
now. It's my it's like one of the biggest podcasts in the world. It's one of my favorites. It's like mostly true crime. Uh, but they're big horror fans too. And so they'll they like anyway, they just did a, a like an hour or so interview with him um this past week, I think it was, or two weeks ago. Um and one of them, when they were introducing him, they said he's the modern day Lon Chaney. And when I heard that, I was like, holy shit, dude, that actually is pretty accurate. Like he really is yeah. because it, it's like you said, like he, he plays p- prominent roles. Like it's not like he's a bit part, but he's always the, you know, the, the character guy. He's not ever the leading guy. And that was what I said in my review of this was that it was so nice to finally see him as the main you know, whole movie basically as him being the center of it and having to carry it. And, and I agree. I'd love to, cause I really do think he's a chameleon. Like I think he can play, I mean, like, dude, if you take the, this role and compare it to, uh, his character in, um, uh, last voyage of the Demeter or his character in Dune, you know, or his character in boogeyman, like they're, they're just all different, super different. Yeah. Like you'll throw a beard on and become someone completely different. Like yeah. a lot of people don't well, even he's recognize an accomplished, him. He's an accomplished stage actor. And so that doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, so that's not surprising that, you know, that he can do that. And I think he still does theater. Like, I think yeah. he's still a, an, a, an active member in a couple of theater troops. And uh, so that's what, that's really good to see. Um, I want to move on a little bit to um, Immaculate because it's the other movie that's shattering records. It looks like according, and I have to look on my other screen over here, but it looks like, it looks like according to the numbers, like it's starting to drop off just a little bit, but it did, it did get a bump, uh, this past weekend and it's made over $6 million, uh, yeah, domestically. It made 5.3, uh, through, uh, it's official opening weekend. So Thursday, yeah, it's a Friday, huge, Saturday. Yeah. So, so it, yeah, 5.3 and then it, it, it dipped, it had a little bit of a slowdown and then it looks like it's hitting it again for this weekend. It looks like it's going up. And it's so, funny so because we'll, we'll that uh, uh, people hear us mention 5.3 opening for this or, uh, what was late night with the devil? Uh, 2.8 for late night with the devil. Those do sound super small, but they're literally record setting openings for IFC and, and neon. And it's because these are tiny indie movies. These are movies that had like million dollars or less budgets. Like these are not like this one. Sydney Sweeney basically paid for this movie to get made. Like the story is she auditioned for this role years ago and didn't get the role. The movie ended up getting, uh, it kind of fell through, fell apart. And so the script was still just sitting there. Um, And so then recently she, or I guess a year and a half or so ago, she contacted the writer and was like, I want to make this movie happen. I want to be the lead and I want to. And so she got people uh, on board and got a team of investors together. But I know that like a big chunk of it was her, you know, her putting her own money up. Uh, But literally she found everybody and got it going, got it a distribution deal with neon and everything. And so like, this is a hundred percent her baby. And the fact that in opening weekend, it's already over doubled. uh, You know, it's already in the, in the red or I mean in the black, I'm sorry. Black. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's so exciting because we're talking about someone that doesn't need to do this. Cindy Sweeney is like one of the hottest young people actors who can be in anything right now i mean she's already done marvel shit she's already done um spider-man shit like she's already you know doing big properties and big things but there's nothing i love seeing more than when actors get these roles like that you know they get these big marvel whatever and they take that money and they go invest it into horror there's yeah. literally nothing that makes me more excited than that it's like what james well, Wan think, did right where he goes think, and gets all this big money for aquaman and then turns around and makes malignant like yeah. it, you know like malignant or not the fact that he went and invested his own money right back in i love that well and i think i think sydney sweeney wants to move on from madam webb as fast as she can so yeah <laughs> Yeah, this, and this, is mean, definitely, she's, this is definitely the way to do it. She's, you know, I mean, she'd had the biggest comedy rom com of all of last year. Uh, it was actually a really sweet movie. I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but like, it looked really stupid from the trailer. But it actually ended up being a really sweet 
little rom-com. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, she's killing it. Like everything she's in right now has been successful except for Madam Web. But even that she was a, she was barely in that movie. She had a super small role in that. Uh, the white Lotus. That's a TV series. Yeah. Oh, any, anyone but of, you. Yeah. Anyone but you. Ugh. Yeah, but look how much it made. I mean, I, I guess. Did you see it? No. It's way different than you'd expect. It's actually right. a lot better. It's a lot better of a movie. What and once again, it's Sydney Sweeney, man. Like surprisingly, she she can act. Like she's got some really emotional like uh, levels in that movie. You know, of course. You know, it, it's not immaculate. I mean, immaculate was fucking awesome. I love that movie, but I'm just saying, like, it was actually a, a much better movie than you than you would expect. But you didn't get um, a chance to see Immaculate, yet, did you? No, I haven't been able to see it yet. That's 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 on my list. I got I still have to see that in Ghostbusters. So I I, yeah. I, I got well. I got I gotta watch those. So Ghostbusters is about as mid. It's like super mid. It's not bad at all. And it's like, if you, if you loved, um, I didn't even do a review of this. So this is actually my review guys. Anybody listening? Oh, <laughs> uh, here we go. Um, well, hang on. Do we, do we want to, do we want to wait? Because, uh, we can move on. I, we can, cause the next bit of news is the ratings that, uh, blood and honey got. So do you want to, do you want to write or no, no I'm, I'm, sorry, Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so yeah. Dumb. You, you're talking about Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters we can, is we another do, story. We can, do, we can do Ghostbusters. Yeah. Here, so hey. let's talk about how successful it was and then I'll give okay. my a little review. All right. Well, give me, give me one second. Let me, let me, let me pull it up since we're, since we're jumping around here. Um, uh, this is uh Ghostbusters. Um, um, crap. What's it called? Not afterlife. That was the first one. Um, frozen empire, frozen empire. That's right. Uh, let me let me bring this up. Sorry, folks. Uh, while I'm bringing it up, if you have not hit the like button on this video yet, please yes, do please so. Do. Um, we, uh, and subscribe to Blood Scribe Creations uh, so that you can get the show. Uh, but uh, if you're watching on Twitch, hi. I don't see any viewers yet, but hello. If you're watching on Facebook, we love to see you on Facebook. Please hit the like button and then come over to YouTube and uh, join the chat. The chat's very active. Uh, we have a good chat here. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So if you haven't hit that like button yet, please, please do so. Uh, and I am pulling up ghostbusters now ish. I think on bloody disgusting. Did, are you opening the story that's on there? Uh, I'm opening, I'm trying to open it on the numbers cause I want to see, um, I have the numbers, but there's a, it'll say it on the story that I'm talking about that talks about, you don't have um, to, we could just simply talk about the numbers. Uh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead and go ahead and uh, go ahead and. Because there's your... the story that talks about how I had a bigger opening than. Uh, um, um, here it is. Here, here we go. Yeah. So here's the numbers from Ghostbusters. It's made 52 million. Excuse me, 52 million so far uh, domestically. 16 million box uh, international. That gives it a 68.3 million worldwide. So Which is a good bigger opening. opening. It's a bigger opening than Afterlife. Yeah, but Which it doesn't, is, but it doesn't seem like anybody's talking about it. Yeah, and that, and that's what's surprising to me. I didn't feel a buzz like before Afterlife came out. There was a huge buzz. It was. It felt like everybody was talking about that movie, and that movie came out closer to 2020. So it was like less people were going out to the theaters, and yet. Uh, there was more buzz. I don't know. It's a very strange thing. It's a very strange thing. I think maybe it is because everybody's a lot more people are back going to the theaters. So even though it's a bigger number than that one, it was like, le like the masses are more out and about going to movies again. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't, ha it isn't necessarily as big of a buzz. I don't know. Um, but I, I also, I don't know. Well, if you want to give your review, I, go ahead and do that. I have, I have coals that I need to change. So, uh, so here is, uh, here is, uh, the ghost pirate entertainment review of, uh, Ghostbusters, the frozen empire. <laughs> put me on, put me on blast. Um, Ghostbusters frozen empire. I feel like it sets in that same 
place as afterlife and, and i've seen a, like a lot of hate for for this one and i don't really exactly get why because it yes it borrows a lot from the the original movies but so did afterlife and yet people seem to really enjoy that one i feel like this is a lot more of the same uh there are some problems with it one of the things that that bothered me about it was that it it feels like too many things going on there's like too many storylines too many characters and and because of that it just kind of feels bloated and like it's hard to kind of keep track of everything all the time but there are some really uh, excuse me some really cool things in it like i love the new technology like using a drone i thought it was a really creative fun idea uh the main baddie in this like is pretty creepy looking pretty badass but i mean i i guess it just isn't i'm not sure what people are expecting or wanting from a, a ghostbusters movie now because like they never were these gritty horror movies. They were always basically a comedy with a little bit of, of a, you know, a spooky uh, surrounding like periphery. They were never like straight horror. Uh, maybe it's just that we're all older now. And so we just see them differently, but I just don't know exactly what people are wanting from it. Um, one of my big complaints though, with it is I just feel like the OG characters need to go away at this point. It's like they if they do make another one, it needs to be completely just this new group. I, I feel like trying to still throw a bone to these these super old guys, it just feels weird. It just feels so and I and that's part of like how it's written, I guess. Like I'm sure there is a better way you could present that and put them in without it feeling so uh, fan service like it feels very much like they're forcing these og characters into it and so maybe that i mean that's probably that's probably probably my biggest problem with it just that and that it felt like too many people too many things going on um i've heard some people complaining that the daughter her whole you know side story kind of thing like the, the, that's kind of the main story and that the ghostbusters thing is secondary. I don't agree with that. I don't really agree with that at all because I feel like the thing that was, that's going on with the daughter in this is the whole point of the entire narrative of the story of this movie. Like I, I, I'm dancing. I'm trying to dance around this with, you know, cause I don't want to give anything away, but like, I felt like uh, it needed to kind of, it went along with the story. It didn't need to be there, but it went along with the story. And I don't think that it was too much. So, but like, these are just family movies. And like, I think maybe that's people's problem is the first two were a little more adult, you know, the jokes, the, the characters, it felt, it felt more adult, like the, not, not like hard R adult or anything, but still it felt more adult, like, and now our PG-13 movies are basically family-friendly movies. And that's what this feels like. It feels very much like a family-friendly movie. I mean, there's literally the entire family at the end of this movie basically doing the whole high-five, you know, together. Like, we're family! Like, it's pretty hokey, pretty cheesy. Kind of, they don't literally do that. But that's basically the end of this movie. And so... I get that if that's your problem with it. But I think, just in general, I mean... It, it's just, it's just a fun little thing. It's, it's just a family friendly, like a good, it's why I didn't do an official review on my channel because I'm like, this is not a horror movie at all. It, it It's as much of a horror movie as um, the haunted mansion was last, last summer. Like this, this is basically a Disney family friendly kind of movie. And so maybe that's the issue. People wanted to go back to being more adult oriented but I didn't really feel like those were that adult in the beginning anyway. So I'm not really sure what people's big issue with it. It's just, it's a mid movie. It's, it's just, it's a popcorn movie. It's like, I always call them. It's a movie that it's like fast food. It's, you know, if you would need something with depth, character development, like 
it's something that's going to wow you. This is not your jam, but if you want to just have a good time, grab your popcorn and your soda and just relax and have a good time with the family. This is a good pick, but yeah. All right. Well, thanks for the official review. And uh, I think the problem, <laughs> I think the, I, th- I, I would say, I guess the problem is that um, just tell a, tell an original story with the, with the new characters, you know, stop trying to dangle the old characters in front of everybody to come out and see it. Tell a good original story with the new ones. You know, well, that's I mean, the thing. This this does try to do that, but it's like it feels handcuffed to the original characters. It's literally how yeah. it feels because it's like the new family is in there and the whole story is about them and about what they're doing. But it's like they had to find a way to still put the original characters in and they just don't fit, they don't, especially Bill Murray. Like Bill Murray felt the most like, what are you in this movie for? Like, like he basically is like a one liner and he's just kind of standing there most of the time. And like kind of the background, like totally feels shoved in here. Like at least yeah, Dan well, Aykroyd's character felt like he had a reason to be in it. If you know, actually had a reason for him to be in it. And he felt like kind of like this older grandfather kind of, you know, like sit on my knee and I'll give you advice kind of character. And that was kind of cool. I don't know. And then Annie Potts, right. Is that her name? Uh, yeah. You know, she, she was another one that just kind of felt like, okay, like, I don't really know why you're here, but okay. Well, I think it's because Bill Murray doesn't want to do these movies, you know? So he's probably, he's probably a pain to work with. Dan Aykroyd probably is excited about it and Bill's just not, you know? So like, yeah. that's probably what it is, you know? Cause there's, I mean, there's stories all over the place, t- you know, talking about how Bill Murray's. Oh, he's very, a, yeah, he's but, a nightmare. Yeah, so that's but he has probably- been that way since the fucking eighties. Like he was a nightmare when these movies, when the first ones were made. Like, that's just who Bill Murray is, you know. Yeah, but I mean, but he was making these movies with his friends. You know what I mean? It wasn't, you know, it was. He doesn't have a writing or or anything. No, on that's this, not. Right? No, he. That's not how the story goes. If you ever get a chance, look into the making of Ghostbusters. Like it, he was. It was supposed to be uh, Eddie Murphy. And they and oh. Eddie Murphy backed out like last minute, basically. And so they got Bill Murray and Bill Murray. They didn't, they, it wasn't that they didn't like Bill Murray. It's just that he was one of those. Sometimes he'd show up. Sometimes he wouldn't. He'd show up late. Sometimes he'd care and, and put in like trying to, you know, be the, you know, the man. And then other times he would just kind of not like, not really show up, even though he was physically there. Like, this and they didn't even know heart. until they didn't even know until day of shooting if he was going to be there. He had basically told Dan Aykroyd, uh, like it was basically a handshake deal. Like, yeah, I'll be there. And Dan Aykroyd wasn't even sure until day of shooting if he was actually going to be there. Oh, jeez. Like, that's just who he is. Like, if you read about Bill Murray, it's it's not like he's a bad guy per se. He's just a pain in the ass. He does everything his way. He is a little bit of a selfish asshole. Uh, but like, it's not like he's a bad guy. He's just one of those weird guys. You know what I mean? Like he's not yeah. a Hollywood type either. It's not like he's a, all about me. Like a, he's not like that either. He's not like a Chevy chase, you know, who thinks his shit don't stink. It's just, he's just a weird dude. Like Dan Aykroyd's a weird fucking guy too. Like, like all his paranormal supernatural shit. Like have you ever oh, heard yeah. all the, Dan, yeah, like they're just weird guys. I, I bought I bought one of the crystal head vodkas that he was. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. They're cool, man. Those it's, are cool. yeah, they're cool looking. Those 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 crystal skull. Uh, the the uh, the actual you know bottles are cool looking. But yeah, I mean I I know all about Dan Aykroyd's weird stuff. But uh, man, yeah. that breaks my heart. That uh, I thought because I thought Bill Murray was great in the Ghostbusters movies. I thought he was. Oh, awesome. he yeah. He's amazing. I I thought that, uh, yeah, it just, it didn't feel like he was ever, it didn't feel, it never felt like he didn't care, but in afterlife, it definitely felt like that he was just there. Like, so he wouldn't get fined. You know what I mean? Oh, wait till you see this one. Oh man. He is so much more checked out in this one than he was in afterlife. Oh, well. All right. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm going to go see it, but you know, I mean like, uh, what's, I can't remember. Fuck. What's the actor's name? The black guy. Um, you know, the other I, main, I, yeah, uh, I, I, I just, I just had it. Isn't it like, isn't, he's pretty awesome in this. He's, isn't it, he, isn't it Eddie something? 
I don't know. I'm totally spacing his name. I know. I see. Yeah. I think it's, I think uh, Eddie, yeah, it's, um, he's, he's not as big of a name as the other guys. Or it's not Ernie. And I, uh, Ernie Hudson, Ernie, not Eddie. Yeah, I, Ernie, I, I, Ernie, had yeah. It, I had it. And then it yeah. just went away. Like, that's, that's like what he, happened he's great. Me. He's great in this. Like he legitimately has a reason to be in this movie and you could feel like he is excited and happy to be there. Same with Dan Aykroyd. Uh, Annie Potts is just kind of there. And then Bill Murray is totally checked the fuck out. Like, I mean, uh, the moment you first see him on screen, you're like, that dude does not want to be here. He's not. Like, be- what is going on? Uh, it's Ernie just Hudson, weird feeling. Uh, Ernie Hudson, uh, Officer Albright or Albrecht, in the crow that's one of my that's one of my favorite roles uh by by him is uh is that mm-hmm. the the cop in the crow uh so shout out to ernie for for playing that awesome that movie role. yeah i know a dude, friend of so- mine just played it yesterday at his theater he uh uh has a podcast uh epic film guys but he like on every monday night he um uh runs a movie night at this theater basically and he, they play a different, like an old movie, every an old horror movie or horror ish movie every week. Nice. Uh, and last night was the crow. Ah, uh, I'd love to see that. I, like, the I know. I know. I would love to see that. I like, yep. I, I saw it in a theater, but like I was 17. 18, oh man. Like yeah, Lucky so I, like, dog. I don't, I don't remember it. <laughs> I, I know I went, but I don't remember much else. I, I remember buying the soundtrack that night, like literally leaving the movie theater, driving to tower records and buying the CD and just literally on repeat for weeks. Yeah. So many iconic songs on that, on that soundtrack. Yep. Probably not going to be as many on the remake, but who cares? Um, all right. Well, uh, so we've been, yes, whoops, but this. I just think it's, I hope that the 17 year old Kanan out there in the world right now feels the same about it because there's no way that 40, what am I? 46, 46 year old me would have been like about, you know what I mean? Like I was 17 when that movie came out. So it's like what I was into then and what I'm into now are way different. So I honestly think this new, the the more I watched the trailer and thought about it, the more I'm like, of course it's not going to be our jam, dude. It's not really our, you know what I mean? It's not our crow. Okay. Well, but so, so, so so you don't think, you don't think music tastes evolve or like, you don't think you can, whether you have the same music taste, like you still can tell like good music from bad music. You, you don't, you yeah, don't think I don't know that. I, I don't see, don't know. It could have a bad soundtrack. I'm just saying, like, it's possible for me to just be like, eh, about the soundtrack. And it, but it, it resonates with the 17 year olds out there. And that's what that original one did. And that's the, what it should be doing. Right. You well, know? I mean, we'll see. I mean, I, I, it could have a shitty soundtrack. I don't know. You know, like, I, after watching the trailer, though, I do think it looks. It honestly, to me, it, it felt like a, like it's made for the 17 year olds and the 18 year olds of the world, the same way the original one was. So I'm just going to go into it with an open mind. Like, I'm just, I'm not saying it's going to be an amazing movie, but I'm, you know, going to keep my expectations in check. Like I tell people all the time to do. All right. Well, I mean, that's fair, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm going to probably go see it uh, or pirate it. Um, and, uh, cause I'm not sure I want to give them money and then, uh, don't I'll, I'll say, don't publicly <laughs> say you're going to pirate something, dude. <laughs> ah, it's fine. Nobody watches this show. Uh, so anyway, um, so we, we started talking about it a little bit, but, uh, the second Winnie the Pooh, uh, Winnie the Pooh two blood and honey, um, ITN has been sharing around their uh, tomato meter reviews and yeah, um, keep talking for a minute. I'm it looks like right. it looks like uh, they might have been sharing it uh, a little prematurely because the later in the release that this movie gets, uh, the further um, the ratings drop. So right now it's still sitting out of fresh. And for those of you, you know, watching or sorry, for those of you listening on audio, uh, according to Rotten Tomatoes, 
Uh, they have 16 official critic reviews and it's at 63 percent oh damn it's already down to 63 yeah. <laughs> percent wow. yeah and, and 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 the audience reviews are finally coming in and it's down to 83 percent on the audience reviews and the audience reviews are generally going to be better but um the, you also need to take rotten tomatoes uh ratings with a, a hefty handful of salt because they're it's was, just important uh, to understand how they work well it's just well yeah sort of but it's because it's, it's a tricky it's system because average. like i no, it's because you can have, thing. I've seen this. No, no, no. So they changed Rotten Tomatoes, and I'm not one of these conspiracy theory guys. I'm really not, but Rotten Tomatoes, they fucked with Captain Marvel's ratings and they switched their whole algorithm around to save that movie. That that they did. And so you can have a, a critic review a movie and they can say, um, they can they can trash the movie in their review, but then still give it a fresh rating because it you know, they gave it over, what is it like three and a half or something like that? But they can be like, look, this is a three and a half. You're not going to get anything story wise. Characters are bad. The movie's too long, blah, 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 three and a half. And according to Rotten Tomatoes, it's a fresh. And it's just like, yeah, that's it's basically if, if you're, if you give it one point above average, like you're giving it a 51%, that means it's, it's red. Right. You so, know? and so, and the, the problem is, is if, Everybody says it's one point better than average. So it's a, every, every reviewer says it's 51. It's going to say it's a hundred percent on rotten tomato. Right. But even so though they, they're only saying it's a six out of 10. Right. But so, yeah, so, so I would say, uh, but they, they, I, I don't know if they did it to help the captain marvels. I don't know. I'm not going to, argue one way or the other on that but that was when they changed their 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 system uh to what they believed is a more fair system but in my opinion and a lot of people's it's worse now it is absolutely worse so i don't know i i don't understand why they can't do it like imdb you know imdb is like it's like every other rating system in all of mankind it's basically one through ten that's what it, how it works. Yeah, and then like some, it, and there's you know. some reviews are weighted or a little weighted. I mean, they, they, you know, they have verified audience scores and then all audience scores, you know, so there's, you just have to, you can't just look at a rating anymore. You like, you have to research a friggin' rating anymore. And it's just like, come on, why are we doing this? You know, like the, the whole review bombing conspiracy is just, is out the door, but we have seen studios, Disney, uh, um bombing in the positive direction for their film. Well, this movie. I mean, there's I, no I know, way, I'm not, I'm not there's no this, way this movie got a hundred percent. It's just the first six reviews or wherever it was that were out at the time when it was getting like a hundred percent or whatever. It's just because every friends. one of those were friends. They're, right. Like it's obvious because they just right. dropped 40%. <laughs> So, right exactly so once real people started watching this movie they were like yeah, yeah it's gonna not that it's good gonna end up it's gonna end up around a 30 somewhere probably a 36 somewhere between yeah. a 30 and a 40 yeah. and that's what i would give it i would have given the original one uh t like between 10 and 20 percent and this one i would give it like a 30 to 40 somewhere in that range you know it's not quite it's not quite an average. Yeah, actually, I'd, I guess I'd give it around a 40. Closer to a 40 than 30, but not a 50. Yeah, like, it's not horrible. It's just, I I just could not engage with it because I just kept being like, dude, move you. <laughs> Figure out what you are. Like, are you going to be this, like, super ultra serious like think piece dramatic movie. Well, if you're going to do that, then you shouldn't be trying to make a Winnie the Pooh movie, like a Winnie the Pooh horror movie. Like the, right. those two things do not go together. And like I said, it's very clear to me. It's, it's this, these young filmmakers that want to make serious, scary, dramatic, intense, gritty horror movies, which is awesome. But the only way for them to make money right now is, to, or for them to get the money right now to make their movies is by doing this IP. And so they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. And it just, it just doesn't work in my opinion. Like if yeah. I was them, I would 
totally lean into the campy quality of it. Have fun with it. Make up, make some money up, save some money, and then ride off in the sunset and make you, the movies you really want to make. You know, save up like 10, 20 million and go make a couple of the, the real horror movies that you guys actually want to make. And like, because honestly, it's so crazy to me because I was thinking about this really hard earlier. I even said this in my review, but I thought about it a lot more after shooting the review. If they were to take this exact movie, but instead of these are anamorphized or mutated animal human hybrids, right? If they were to just be crazy serial killers wearing these masks. So if this was like this dude who wore a Winnie the Pooh mask and everything else is exactly the same in the movie as far as like, I would have been on totally on board. I'd be like, that's fucking cool, man. But because they're these mutated animal things, it's like right away, the credibility, the, the, the reality of the situation goes out the window. And then they try to throw in this whole mutated, you know, this mad scientist making these mutated animal things. And they retcon the first movie. <laughs> So that they can do this because everything that happened in the first movie, they say that that movie wasn't a movie inside of the universe of this movie. Like how convoluted is that? <laughs> like yeah. even just trying to explain that I'm like, that's confusing. And like, who's going to care? Yeah. That's what you I know? mean. Because <laughs> it's Winnie the Pooh. Everybody right. just wants to go there and see Winnie the Pooh run around and kill people and gory shit. Like, that's fine. Like, that is why I, because the thing is, this is really close to Terrifier, but that's the difference between Terrifier and why I'm on board with Terrifier versus this, because Terrifier knows what you're there to see. It doesn't try to really throw you much of a story. It's like, mostly you're here to see gory, fucked up shit. So we're going to, and even that was your problem with Terrifier, right? Was that the story was kind of a well, mess, right? Isn't there is no story in the Terrifier movies. One, one and yeah. two. They they attempted a story in two, and I two. guess, but um, it's just it's right still a mess. With problems. Yeah, it's still a mess. But I, yeah. uh, but I, I defend it because I'm like, they know that's not why people are there. So they, they give you a little bit of a story. Like to me, I think they found a pretty good balance in the second one. Could they do a better story? Yeah. Could they still work on that? And yes, and they and they will because literally the first movie Damian Leone ever wrote was the first Terrifier. He's a special effects artist. That's how he's right. made his bread and butter. Like up until Terrifier, he didn't make movies. He made Terrifier as a, a means to basically show off his special effects prowess, and it was basically to show Hollywood, like, hey, look what I can do. Uh, it just happened that that movie took off, and so he wrote terrifier too. And I feel like he did a much better job of writing. It actually feels like there is some more of a story there. It's still a mess. Right. And so I, my, I I'm pretty sure terrifier three is going to be an even better story because we're still talking about a guy who's still learning how to make movies, but right. at least if you like, that's the, what I talk about, about being self-aware. Like he's aware he doesn't know how to write shit. He doesn't know how to make movies. So what he leans into is what he does know. And that's the special effects, the gory craziness. Like that's what he knows. So he leans into that. And these guys should have done the same thing, but it's like, they, they don't, they're not being self-aware and that's yeah. And that's what it's frustrating to me, but. I don't know. Well, I, like I said, I really hope we got a them, whole, I really we, wish we got, them the best. We got a whole Poonie verse to look forward to. So, you know, they're <laughs> the movies are, they're coming out. So, nope. um, yeah, the next looking, one I believe is Pinocchio or Peter Pan, or I don't know. There's a Bambi, a Peter Pan and a Pinocchio one all coming very soon. Yeah. Um, so, well, well, we're about, Eight. It's about an uh, hour and a, hour and fifteen minutes. So I'm gonna catch up on some of these chats. Um, let me see here. What do we got? Uh, Leslie says she finally watched stop motion and loved it. So there you go. Uh, James says the animation. Yeah, you still haven't seen that, have you? I've seen stop motion. I saw. Yeah, I saw it opening weekend. 
I, I did a review about it on my other channel. Oh yeah. But didn't we talk about it on the yeah, podcast we, that week? Yeah. We talked about it a little bit. It's just, it was so fresh. We didn't really talk that much about it because you know, I didn't want to spoil it too much. Oh, that's right. We were going to talk about it again when it drops on shutter. Yeah. So when it drops on shutter, we'll, we'll, we'll watch it again and talk about it. Um, yeah. Leslie says, uh, that movie is moist. <laughs> I'm not, well, I'm not sure what, what movie Leslie that's, that's stop motion. Stop. Stop motion is moist. Oh, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah the yeah. little puppet dudes are like, they're all made of raw, raw meat. So they, they all have that slimy, like moist looking quality. It's fucked yeah. up. Uh, but the, the, they look so much like the tool music videos. It, yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I think that was a lot of people's introduction to stop motion was the tool music video. What was that? Schism? Is that what the, what the song was? I don't, I don't uh, no, the first one was uh, Undertow. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, their but first like, two music nice videos movie. were stop motion. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Hunter says, I'm going to be honest. I thought sober, the was okay. Sober, sober and Undertow, I believe, were the both. Those are the stop motions? Yeah, I believe. I know. Yeah. I think. Hunters, I think hunters did other ones, but just different style of stop motion. Hunter says, I'm going to be honest. I thought the strand was okay. Well, there you go. Uh, it's not James, horrible. It's just like I said, you would have had to have been there. Like it's hard to go back and watch stuff from the eighties and nineties. A lot of times, depending on what it is. Like I think especially the nineties, the pacing of shit was like fucking slow. Like, yeah. And then, Stephen King too, like a lot of Stephen King adaptations are, are hard to watch because everybody feels like they got to make it just like the book kind of thing. And it's like, it doesn't, tr his books do not translate that well into a movie unless you speed the fuck things up, take a lot of the detail shit out and get more to the point. Cause he's very long and drawn out. And when you're painting a world through reading it, it, it it's fine it works it doesn't in a movie right that's why I think james says out of he misses with stephen king james says out of king's movies i like cujo the best really that's that's what he says it's good it's less of a horror movie though to me it's much more of like a thriller uh yeah not that that's yeah. in a horror family but i'm just saying it's not as like like when I think of Stephen King I, and I think of horror movies, like I don't think of that one, you know, like to me, misery is probably, probably his best as far as the Stephen King adaptations. Although my personal favorite would be, um, Salem's lot, even though I, okay. I, I know it's a flawed movie. It's not like it's, but the, the vision of Toby Hooper as a director, um, the history behind it and the special effects in that movie and just the mood and creepiness, like, uh, you know, but it's I a tie between it's a tie between Gerald's game and Dr. Sleep for me. Well, as far as modern ones, fuck yeah. Both those are incredible. Yeah. Uh, Hunter says, I actually enjoyed Winnie the Pooh blood and honey too. It was a hell of a lot better than the first, but not a great movie. What is wrong with you? <laughs> no you're right you're right i i just i feel like i got a little bit caught up. like i think a lot of people are going to take my review and think that i'm saying it's like i rewatch my reviews you know because i'm editing them and i'm not going to redo it but i shot it immediately at, that's why I sometimes or most of the time i wait until the next day to shoot a review because then I've kind of come down a little bit and I'm in a right. little more of like a base level. Uh, and I feel like I'm, a, I was probably a little hard on it, but it wasn't that I, I was being hard on it. It's just, I was really stuck on that one thing. And it's my big problem of frustration with these guys is that they need to stop being like, they need to be self-aware and stop taking themselves weight. Like so serious, like guys loosen the fuck up. Like you're making a Winnie the Pooh gimmick movie, right? You're making a gimmick uh, so, slasher movie. Like, come yeah. On. And so I make a huge deal of that. And that's mostly what I talk about. And so if you're just, you don't know me and you don't know the content, you're just like watching it as a review, you know, you're going to take it as me shitting all over your movie. 
or shitting right. all over their movie. But it's not that I think it's shit. It's definitely better. But also, you got to keep in mind, I came off of watching um, Late Night with the Devil, then Immaculate, then I watched Ghostbusters Afterlife, and then Sting, which everybody's going to be raving about that movie in two weeks when it comes out. Sting, cool. I, I got to see it at an early screener thing, uh, but it'll hit theaters in two weeks. It is like a good old fashioned creature feature, like we haven't nice. had in quite a while. It's fucking great. It's like a, like a, um, oh, what's the name? Uh, arachnophobia, but if it nice. was R rated, but an oh, R rated awesome. arachnophobia. I loved arachnophobia. Yeah, I thought it was like, great. The spider, spiders are fucking cool in this. Fucking cool. Uh, Hunter says, Late Night with the Devil is one of the best original horror movies I've seen in years. High high praise from Hunter. It was good. Hunter, um, I'm telling you, you need to watch my videos and w- where I recommend Shudder IFC movies because it would open up a whole new world to you because not taking anything away from Late Night with the Devil, but like literally every year I have see shutter put out at least five movies or so that are as good or better than that every single year, you know, and we've already had stop motion earlier this year that I, I think at this point I would put late night with the devil above it, but not by a lot. Um, oh, but I like would. last year when evil lurks fucking incredible, incredible movie. Uh, we also had a watcher not too long ago. We had, I mean, like literally every year shutter drops, just so many amazing horror movies and people just don't know the names of them. So they don't realize they exist. And it's because the pop culture doesn't like, you know, publicize them. Right. Amanda says, Hey, Hey Amanda. Good to see you. Hey, heart lady. Everybody is, uh, everybody's talking about Ghostbusters. James says Ghostbusters isn't great. They still rip off the first movie. Said he'd give it about a four out of 10. Wow. But they're basically a soft reboot. They're basically soft reboots. Like that's something that I don't think a lot of people like realize. Like how do you reboot a franchise without you either do it one of two ways. You either make a sequel that takes all that past history and the characters and all that and still gives them some love but starts a new set of movies and you either do that or you just pretend those ones never existed and complete and nobody wants to see that you know it's like or you just or what we just don't get ghostbuster movies ever again like you can only you can't you can't do like there's not a lot of other ways of doing it I don't think, but so, I mean, yeah, I agree, but I don't think we need more Ghostbusters movies. Like that would be my opinion. Well, that's I wasn't fine, clamoring. But... I wasn't clamoring for more Ghostbusters, especially after Ghostbusters 2016. Ugh. Yeah. You know and see, mean? that's my point. That's what happens when you do a reboot, like a full stop reboot. That was garbage. I would yeah. much rather see afterlife. Did you see afterlife? Yeah. Yeah. I saw it. Yeah. I thought it was okay. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, and that's what I'm looking at this one. I these movies are not made for us old heads. You know what I mean? Like to me, if I come out going that was all right, that's a win because they're made for the eight year olds, the ten year olds, the twelve year olds, the same as we were for the originals. Like I don't understand why adults can't get that through our fat fucking skulls. Like there's shit out there that isn't for you. <laughs> like there is, there's a whole new set of humans out there that are going to have a whole life and their own things that don't need us. They're nothing to do with us. I mean, the world doesn't revolve around us guys. Oh, I mean, okay. I, so I'm going to push back on that a little bit because if that were true, then none of the classics would be popular with anybody. Right. What do you mean? That's not the same. Well, it is. Why are no, classic? No, these aren't, why these are aren't classic taken away from classic the original. Stories classic. No, no, but no. These I'm aren't taken away from those. Fine, but you're trying to say that like these movies are made for somebody that's not us, so therefore we can't what have an opinion on them. No, I'm saying that they're. If you come out being like that was all right, that is a win because they're not designed for us. 
They're not designed for us to dislike them either, but they're not made. We're not the target audience. These are made for kids like we were when the originals came out. Like, just like when you try to like a lot of, a lot of times, right. If you were to take the original uh, Ghostbusters, right. And show it to an eight year old right now, or a 10 year old, most of them are not going to be enamored with it the way that we were when we were eight or 10. They're just not. Why? Why? Because they don't enjoy the older shit the same. Like, but for some reason, kids understand it. Adults don't. Like, that's not for them. Like, hmm. most teenagers are not going to enjoy the original The Crow. Not on the same level that we did. They'll still like it and be like, yeah, it was cool. Watch. I'm telling you, look it up. Like, you can go on YouTube and watch, like, young generation reacting to things like The Crow or or different movies or different songs, music, whatever. Like, And it's interesting because it, it's never – it's not that they don't like it. It's not that they're like, that's ah, garbage. You know what I mean? They still get what makes it interesting. But they're not like we were for it, right? But it's the same. Like, we need to, as adults, think about it like it's the flip, right? It's when we see something for the younger generation – if we, you know, like if it's, if it's really a good, if it's really good, chances are we're going to be like, yeah, that was cool. Whereas they're the ones that are going to be like, this is iconic. This is shit that we're going to be talking about in 20 years. This is going to be our new cult classic. Uh, All right. I guess. I don't know. That's <laughs> the idea. It doesn't always work. But yeah. I'm saying that's the idea. That's why you make the crow, the new the crow. That's the whole reason why it's angled at that teenage audience. But you don't it, have to. You know, but what, but okay, but you don't. But don't call it the crow. Make an original. The crow is an I original agree. movie. It's not like the crow came out and was like we want to make a movie that's going to resonate with the Gen X. Uh, you know, kids. Now. Yeah, but it's a good story. These, we're going to put these. Uh, but it's yeah, a good the crow, story, the, the crow and it, good it'll story. work. But they're not doing the crow. They're not doing the James O'Barr comic book story. They're but they're doing, still no, using. They're, they're taking the inspiration from it and they're making a, a new modern reimagining of it. Yeah, that I, that doesn't mean it's going to work. Around. It's it, not. It work. might suck. That's so, not my point, though. But what I'm. But that's what not I'm my point. I'm say, talking about the intentions behind it. If it's well executed, you know that that's a whole different argument, right? like if it's well done or not but, but just like the idea it, behind it is is valid just make it just make a different movie don't call it the crow call it anything but else. then you can't use that story and that's such a great idea for a story then leave that story where it is if it's done right movie. if it's done right i mean like i am just fine with rebooting things and all of that it's about it being done right like some of the greatest movies ever made were remakes. Like the thing is probably the greatest horror movie ever made, at least in some people's minds. In my mind, it's the greatest horror movie. It's not my favorite, but it is the greatest horror movie in my opinion. And that is a remake. It's a reimagining of a earlier story of earlier writings. And yet it's the, you know, to me, the greatest thing ever made, like for a horror movie. Like there's a lot of cases like that. It's just about how it's executed, how it's done. There's nothing inherently wrong with doing a remake to me. It's just how you do it. Like, what's what are you trying to accomplish with it? But so yeah, much of that, it. like we talk about all the time, right? It's like lightning in a bottle. It's like, you know, you're putting a movie together right now. Like, think about how many things could go good or bad with your movie. And it's like if all the line, stars align and everybody does their job right and everything works out, you know in your head what kind of movie you could make. You're like, dude, if everything works out right, this could be a fucking awesome movie. And like, who knows how far this could take me and all that, right? But then you also know how many things that if they go sideways could make this whole project way harder. And, and that's your job right now is to try to get as many of those things sorted out ahead of time so that they don't go wrong. But the point is, a movie is different than like any other form of art. Like when you're making, if you're in a band, right? I was in a band for a long time, multiple bands. I've recorded lots and lots of songs to get a, a song to come full circle and be recorded and all of that. It takes teamwork, but you're talking about teamwork between four, maybe five people. There's a huge end and you rehearse the fuck out of it. Cause it's a song. It's four minutes, five minutes. You can play it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And you play it live in front of people and all that shit. And yet, 
it's still so fucking hard to get that to translate onto recording like it like it could if everything connects right. Some people just do not do good in theater or like in a in a recording studio. They just don't. Like they lock up, they don't play with the same you know like passion whatever it is and it just doesn't translate on recording as well as it does live whatever. But a movie it's like 10 people, 20 people, a hundred people, a thousand people, like depending on the size of your movie, you know what I mean? There's so many people that have to work together. And so it's like, you know, a remake, whatever, an idea is an idea. It's all about how it's executed. I guess. And even then look at the maniac remake. So fucking good. And yet no one knows about, no one even knows that movie exists. Well, because I don't think I don't think you're talking about the 2001 Maniac, right? Joseph Gordon Levitt. What? That's you're talking about? I thought it. Which Jordan Levitt? I, no, it's uh, uh, what's his name? Isn't it? Uh, there's a lot. Sorry, I'm. There's a lot of movies called Maniac. It's 2012 with Elijah Wood. Okay, I don't know. I don't want. I'm not. I'm not like. I don't. Whatever. I haven't seen. I saw the original Maniac, and I thought it was good, but I haven't seen the remake, so I'm not. I don't. I, I don't have an opinion on it. Yeah. All I was saying is like that. It's a really, really good movie, and everybody I've got to watch it has been like, "Damn, dude, what the fuck? How can nobody talks about this?" And well, yet, because I don't think like, Maniac. Good. Well, because I don't think the original Maniac was that popular anyway. It was a good movie, but I don't think it was that popular. So, like a remake of it, I'm not sure is going to be that 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 much more popular either. yeah i'm just saying like you could make a great movie and it could be a remake and people don't even see it <laughs> you yeah. know like, i guess so. I mean, I there's so many there's so many variables when it comes to stuff like that garrett says hey finally caught a live one hey garrett good to see you what up garrett uh he says what does he say garrett's been in the in the chat since he joined um so he's talking about some stuff. He says, I, I've often noticed that people tend to like most of the thing they saw first. Uh, people who saw Texas Chainsaw Mask remake first tend to like it better than the original. Um, I haven't seen the Texas Chainsaw remake yet, so I'm not sure if it's I, about. I it. Hold on. Which one? You haven't seen. Uh, one I don't know. There's a couple. Uh, yeah, I saw the first Texas Chainsaw. I haven't seen anything else after it. See, I think you might like the 2000, what is it, 2001? Maybe. I don't know. There they, they, like have been, been a couple. That's probably true because I like the Friday I like the 2009 Friday the 13th better than the original. Uh but that's really? not that's not a, that's not a Oh yeah. No, no, I have to, I've talked about that. It's got one of the best well, yeah, it's got but, one of the best lines in movies. See, I I just think it's uh It's not so much the first one you see. It's the one that is of your time. Like we are able to identify with movies that are from a certain era in our life. It doesn't matter when you see it because like I didn't see the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre until years after it was out. Like I might've seen it the same time as the remake, honestly, in like the early two thousands. It was probably when I first saw it. And yet I have still have much more of a connection to it than I do the two thousands one. And like, I I'm telling you, there's just movies like uh, there's something about from the time you're born until you're about 20, anything that was made in that era of your life, you, most people seem to connect with more so than the ones from that next 20 years of your life. And it's not in every case, of course, because there are certain movies that are just so good that they're timeless, right? But well, yeah, but I think but no, I mean I think it's just because you're being exposed at that point, uh, the for the first time to a lot of stuff. So the first movie that you see that's going to resonate with you in that time, yeah, you're going to think you're going to like it. But I don't think it's, I don't know if it's any more or less hard to enjoy a movie that was not made during your time, like. For example, Ghostbusters, right? Well, I mean, any of my favorite horror movies that I wasn't alive when, when well, I, I was one or two, you know, when they came out. 
But that's I mean, my, nightmare, that's night, what I'm saying. No, it's it's of that time span. It's a it, there's I don't know what it is. I don't study human psychology, but I I have seen this. This is not. I'm not just blowing smoke. Like there's something about because you're able to connect to it on a certain level when it's from a certain time period differently than you can from other time periods. And like, that's not to say you're not going to still enjoy a movie from like the black and white era. Like all those movies were made before I was born and I love a bunch of them. Right. But there's a good chance if there was a Frankenstein made when I was like, like in the early eighties, that I would like it more and connect to it more than I would the one from the black and white era. I can almost guarantee it. Like, it's just, you know, like, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, this, that's probably like the true. thing, the thing, even the thing from another world. It's a great movie. I love it. But the thing from the eighties, I connect to on a way higher level. I mean, honestly, it's a better made movie too, but I, there is just something about it. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's something about, in our formative years, like our first 20 years of life, we will always hang on to those things. Like those will always be things that there's a familiarity to it. There's a kinship to it. There's a, some kind of connection to it. And so those movies from that time period generally seem to like for me, the eighties and nineties will always like, I will always be much more connected to those than from any other, you know, from any other time. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I, I mean, I think you're probably onto something, but I, I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Well, think about this, right? How okay. rare is it to hear a 20 year old that says their favorite horror movies are from the eighties? I mean, I don't know. I don't talk to a lot of 20 year olds, but when I was 20, I would say that because my favorite, my favorite. Yeah, but you were movie, a lot closer when you were uh, 20. Uh, what year? How? What year was it when you were twenty? Uh, oh my God! How was two thousand? Hang on. Two thousand seven? No. What year were you born? Eighty-seven. Why can't I do math? Eighty-seven. So ninety-seven. I was ten. Yeah, two thousand seven. You were twenty. Two thousand seven. I was twenty. Wow. Yeah. You're wow. Yeah. Dude, you're you were born in the 80s, bonehead. <laughs> like, I know that but, that proves my point. <laughs> okay, but uh, all right, I don't know, man. I, like I for know. you, I, for you, for you, the 90s and the and the 2000s, like the first 10 years of the 2000s, those would be your primary like your favorite movies more than likely fall into that time span. Between 1990 and and uh 2010. I'll have to take an inventory of my favorite movies and see how true that is. Cause like, I mean, I have a I'd, lot I'd of movies I love nowadays. Like I, there's a ton of movies I love from the last 20 years, but if I were to say my favorite movies, all of them would be from the seventies, eighties or nineties. Guarantee it. You know, Halloween, uh, the thing, phantasm, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that I'm purposely it's I can't help it. They just are. Yeah. It's like I just I'm just saying I don't think it's a coincidence that those are the movies that came out in that time span for me. Yeah. You know, because it I, is and it isn't about what age you were when you saw them, and that's the misconception with it. A lot of people are like, well, yeah, it's because it's about when you see them. And like, no, that's not true because I was a late bloomer because I came from a super religious, like culty fucking household so i didn't get to watch the movies till i was basically in my 20s like late teens early 20s so most of these movies i was already 20 when i saw all of them and yet they were all like 20 years old you know what i mean but yet, yeah be, they were still there's there was something about that there was something to what i'm saying because they all ended up being my favorite movies like i was i know for sure i wasn't uh i didn't see halloween until i was 21 you know, and to this day, I've never missed a Halloween since that I haven't watched it. Like not on Halloween, but sometime during the month of October, I watch it every single year. Yeah, man, you might be onto something. You, you might be onto something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, 
I mean, I, wa <laughs> I watch a lot of horror and I talk to a lot of people about horror. <laughs> I should next time I'm something. in a the next time I'm in a group of 20 year olds, which is probably going to be yeah. never. I, I will. I'll Bullshit. take a. I'll take Bullshit. Some of the people you're working with on this movie are pretty young. Well, yeah, I know, but I mean, there might be. I'm not well, saying they got to be 20, but like, no, you know, I know what you're 20 I know and 30. What, yeah, I know what you're talking about. You're, you're talking about first, you're talking about the uh, er, um, first, uh, what am I talking about? Um, you're talking about late Gen Z or, or sorry, early Gen Z, right? Like, so like, like the first Gen Zers, they're probably around yeah, their people that were now. born. Yeah. Anybody yeah. born basically 2000 and since you'd be 24 years old if you're born in 2000. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So right, basically, well. basically people that you were 20 when they were born, because uh, you were 20 and nine or no, you were 10 and 97. Right. 20 and 2007. Yeah. So anybody that's like at least 10 years younger than you, basically. Okay. It, it well, works even yeah, better. Right. It, it works even better if it's 20 years younger than you, but like, you're not as old as me. So I'm going to ask, but like part of me knowing what I'm talking about, this is for the last, you know, 20 years, I've worked with people way younger than me. Cause I have either been a manager or on some level been in food industry with a bunch of snot nosed 16 year olds and yeah. talk to them about horror ad nauseum. So like, you know, they're all, like any of these, it's so funny when you talk to like 20 or, you know, between 16 and 20 year olds right now, because they talk about movies that me and you think about as still a pretty new fucking movie, but they talk about it like it's a classic. Yeah. Like they'll, they'll talk about uh, uh, it follows literally. And they'll talk about it. Like it's a classic. They'll talk about insidious or sinister. Like they're classics. And you're like, Oh God. Like, <laughs> fuck dude. That's just a couple years ago. But yeah, like no in kidding. their world, like if it's like, five six years old that you know they were like 10 years old it was one of their first horror movies they ever saw man all right well i'm gonna i'm gonna take this opportunity to tell people that uh if you haven't already subscribed to blood scribe creations please do so if you have not liked this video please do so and uh share and our share. show around it's the best yeah it's the best way for us to grow is to, to share the show um after tonight uh, so next week, depending on what we decide to do, I will be day three on shooting the Hellgate. So, um, depending on uh, depending on what's going on yeah. with that, uh, I'll be in. Uh, I'll be well on try the way. Our best. Shooting... We're gonna try our best to have some form of uh, podcast for you next week. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're gonna, gonna not. We haven't decided exactly hey what we're gonna do yet or how it's gonna work out, but we're gonna try to do something. I want to keep the show might, going as much as I can, but, but yeah, it but, might just be me sitting here watching old, uh, watching the old horror movie. It, yeah. yeah. It's keeping me company in the chat. It might end up being that. Like, I know a lot of you in the comments were with me when I did the, the movie nights. So it's very possible for the next few weeks where we'll do something like that. And then maybe have like recorded uh, reviews like we had from Jay tonight or one of the, one of you guys pop in for a little bit. Maybe you can talk for like 20 minutes or something like, yeah, you know, we'll figure yeah. it out. We'll definitely have, we'll definitely have a we'll show. Something. We'll figure something out. We'll have a show, but uh, yeah, going to have a lot of background stuff. So if you're not following blood scribe creations on social media, just at blood scribe creations, Instagram, Facebook, uh, we're not on Twitter slash X. So you're not going to see much there. I am. Uh, I am on me, Twitter. If you want to follow me on X or Twitter, I guess you can. I really, I'm not active, and I honestly just complain about the Browns mostly on 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 that. So if I'm you're, fairly if you're active on fan, Twitter. If you're a football you fan, on Twitter. <laughs> um, poor but Browns. anyways, so that's it. But yeah, I know. Well, hey, you know, man, what? they were they were one of our toughest games last year because I'm a Niner fan. Yeah, we beat that the fucking, shit out of you guys. Dude, you did not. You did not because <laughs> we drove the ball <laughs> down. We drove what? the ball down to kick a field goal to win the game and missed and missed a 30 yard field goal, dude. That's not beating the shit out of them. All, all I saw was that W. It was a slug fest. It was a slug fest. You knocked out three of our best players. Like it was a, it was a muddy, rainy, fucking It was a good game. Day. But I'm just it was saying a good game. You, you beat them, but I'm just saying it wasn't <laughs> like you beat the shit out of them. It wasn't like a 45 <laughs> to 10 or something. 
<laughs> but I'll tell you what, they were one of the teams I was hoping wouldn't make it deep in the playoffs. I was actually more worried about them than the Chiefs or, or we, Ravens. Like there's so something the about Browns, this Browns team. I, I know that I know there's probably not a lot of football fans watching, but I do want to give like I was so proud of my team last year. The Browns had 28% of their salary <laughs> cap. Five different quarterbacks, too. Five different quarterbacks. They had they had 28% of their salary cap on injured reserve and still went into the postseason. The last team to go. So no other team's ever done that in the history of the NFL. The last team to go above 500 with 28% or more of their salary cap on IR, I think was the Ravens in 2005. And the only thing they did was go over 500. So for having that, Plus the their fifth starting quarterback of the season. I thought they did damn good, and I'm I'm excited for next year. But yep. uh, I still um, think if they had had a legit quarterback from the beginning, you know they would have been in serious contention. What's yeah. so frustrating mm-hmm. about about the NFL season though is like you never know the next season because logically you'd be like, they were that good without a quarterback. Like this year, they're going to have a quarterback and like, you know, they're going to be in the mix just like the Niners. Like they were basically one or two plays away from winning the Super Bowl, And you're like, as a fan, I'm like, Oh dude, we're going to be right back there, but you'd never fucking know. The Niners could be in last place this year. A bunch of players get injured and they just shit. Like, yeah, that's what's so frustrating about football. Like I know it's it's not I like know. you can count on that. It's like they're gonna keep, you know. And I mean, fuck, dude, the 49ers have been either in the Super Bowl or the NFC Championship game for the last four years straight, and it's just like it, it's we're coming for know, it. Four, four out of the last it's five coming. The Browns are gonna win one in my lifetime. I know they are. I almost I almost enjoy it more when you're a team that just is trying to get in the playoffs and like when you get in the playoffs you're like yes yeah because everything like you want to crack matters. at it but you're not expecting it. and so if they just get to the playoffs you're like that's fucking amazing because yeah. like when you're where the niners have been for like last every year feels like a failure because you're just like you can't get any further you know what i mean the super bowl you can't get further than that and then like last year in the nfc championship game and then their quarterback gets injured on like the third play it's like you know it just feels like it's stolen away from you. Yeah. And like, dude, there is no way the Niners should have lost to the Chiefs in the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> well, like they had them. They had them. Yeah. They are the, I don't care. Anybody says the Niners were the better team. They just played like shit. They made the mistakes when you just couldn't make the mistakes. And even then they took them to fucking overtime. <laughs> Uh, Garrett says, I'm a Jaguars fan. Your Browns beat us pretty good. Hey, Garrett, we're shooting the Hellgate in Jacksonville. What is wrong with the Jaguars, man? That team (laughs) makes no sense. Like the first Uh, six or seven games last year, it was like the Eagles. Like they just look like they could beat anybody. And then they just like fell off the tracks. Yeah. Well, I think this is what Jay, Jay can probably tell you what the problems is. So Jay, my, you know, you know, Jay, everybody knows Jay, my, my director of photography and, fellow fellow screaming room uh panelist he's a big he's a big uh jaguars fan he could tell you what's wrong with him um Leslie are you wants from to be, cleveland i'm from cleveland originally i moved to jacksonville oh, okay because i'm like yeah. how did you end up being a browns fan yeah yeah i'm originally from cleveland i i moved to jacksonville in 2021 so that that's uh so the jet the jaguars are my adopted team so if if, if ever they're not facing the browns i'm, I'm go jags duval um uh, where, uh, Leslie what says is the deal uh, with Ohio people moving to Florida because Leslie's from Ohio as well. Uh, it's from warmer down Cincinnati, here, Cincinnati, I believe. Yeah, it's it's warmer and down now here. She lives in Tampa. Uh, it's it's warmer. <laughs> like that's that's why we end up down here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that's especially why I moved down here is because it's a lot warmer. I I I Shit. never. I'm trying to get away from the. I'm trying to get away from the warmth. Oh man, I was yeah, I was born and bred in the northeast, northeast Ohio, and I just never got used to it. Um, Leslie, you can be an extra in the Hellgate if you want to be. Just get to uh, get to Jacksonville. And She's we'll, dropping we'll put, me off. Yeah, we'll put you I'll in it. Leslie, stick around. The, I'll be there on the thirteenth. I know we're getting the whole screaming room crew is going to be on the Hellgate. 
she's Garrett, coming with me to drive me down there. So how do you get involved in the Hellgate? It's not necessary. It's not the Hellcat. It's the Hellgate. Um, send, send me an email. The 12th. I'm going to be there from the 12th through the 19th. Yeah, we'll 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 get you in. Uh, I'll I'll figure it out. I'll find a way. Garrett, um, you are you are in St. Augustine. Send me an email, info at bloodscribecreations.com, or just you know hit me up on Instagram at bloodscribecreations. We'll talk to me, brother. Let's let's talk. Uh, the nasty natty is uh is where Leslie's from. Good old good old Cincy. But uh, yeah, so um, that's uh, that's, so that's what, what I said, doing. Leslie. Yeah, she knows. Yeah, she wants to talk about it. Okay. I am. I so I guess uh, argue with me. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I said that. Yeah, we'll get you because I think so. We 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 do have a couple of um, bar and club scenes because the girls go to a metal show, and so I think we have two metal two two scenes where they go to metal shows. So we'll definitely need people in there uh, that are that are attending the show. So you know, come dressed in your uh, your metal gear. And I'm pretty sure that's the uh, that's the that's the week that we're going to be shooting that. So we'll definitely use extras for for stuff like that. So um, anyway, yeah. And so that's I, and I'm gonna, gonna be- and I'm gonna be the the uh, the naked streaker in the movie. It's running, yep, runs, there it across, is. runs across but the club naked. If you ever wanted to see uh, Ghost Pirates uh, <laughs> swing and dong. <laughs> no. <laughs> Watch the hell game. <laughs> I, I don't even want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> all right well i think that's gonna do us i think that's gonna pull us out so uh good show tonight buddy uh we missed jay and bethany but they were on a gig and next week we're gonna be day three into the hellgate for when we have a show so we're gonna have some kind of a show is gonna be going on whether it's whether it's movie time with Kanan or uh we try to pop in for for something we will have a show and uh, it's just, it, I don't know, it might be a little rough. So just hang in with us. But uh, yeah, subscribe to Blood Scribe not- Creations. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook, please. And share the show. We, we want to grow our audience. We love you guys. We have a great chat already with the, the small audience that we have. And we want more people. We want more people to know how fun this show is. So if you like indie horror talk, if you like some horror news, uh, that's that's where, where we're going to be coming from. For That's what we do here on The Screaming Room. If you're listening on audio, please follow us. Please uh, join us on YouTube sometimes Wednesday night. Yep, 7 we're on p.m. we're on Spotify as well. So like, yep, if you guys want to yep. listen to his audio, we are on Spotify, and this episode gets uploaded literally thirty minutes, minutes. after we end the show. So that's when it's going to go up. But uh, anyway, that's it. Thanks a lot for joining us, everybody, and we will see y'all next week. Later, guys. <laughs>